So we're happy to be with you today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful for the people in this room right now. God, we realize that we are gathering together here for an open expression of your love to this community. Let the word of God speak to our lives today. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. amen. I've been up since early this morning. You may be seated. I, uh, uh, I, I did a Zoom call with India this morning early. And uh, I, my interpreter is Pastor Dupte. And uh, he told me today at the conclusion of our Zoom call, he said, oh, Pastor, he said, I got my faith back today. And so uh, my goal today is that we all get our faith back. Yes. Amen. 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 Does anybody, is anybody in here? Just, I just want to be able to believe it. Yes. I want to be able to expect it in Jesus' name. Yes. And so uh, I come to you today. Brother Wolf called me earlier in the week, asked me to take this slot, and then was very specific about what he would like for me to talk about. Yes. Now, he gave me the whole Bible as my uh, source but uh, he chose the subject. And so the subject today is faith for a miracle. And the title of my lesson for the benefit of that focus is open to the miracle. I want everybody just to say that out loud. Open to the miracle. Now I'm going to get way ahead of myself. I'm going to get the cart out in front of the horse right now. Let me tell you what you got to open. The first thing you got to open is your mind. Come on, you got to begin to think, hey, there is a miracle possibility. God could. Come on, this could be a good day. <laughs> Come on, this could be a God day. And so you got to open your mind. Then you got to open your heart. Now, when I say heart, I'm not talking about that thing pumping in the middle of your chest. I'm talking about the center of your being, the soul of your existence. I need you to begin to open your understanding. All that you know and possess, open it and say, the miracle is possible. And then last but not least, you got to open your mouth. Everybody say, it don't count until I say it. Your, the, the focus and the future of your faith is voice activated. God is listening to your words. He's expecting you to speak that word out loud. Come on, I believe God. Come on, I believe that he is. Are you with me yet? And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. All of those things happen by the word of expression. And so in the way of word expression, I want to read from the book of Acts. Chapter 12 says, Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Can I tell you that there are people in this world that get excited? At your misery. They're glad when you don't do well. Come on, they're, I'm just, misery loves company. And that's exactly what he saw. So then were the days of the unleavened bread, it says, and when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and he delivered him to four quarter, quarter yeah, just washed my tongue, can't do a thing with it, quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending, listen to this, after Easter, to bring him forth to the people. Now Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains. And the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him. A light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side, and he raised him up, saying, Arise, up. Quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. 
and he went out and he followed him and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel but thought he saw a vision. Even the guy in the middle of the miracle thought this is not really happening. I must be dreaming. Can I get a witness in this place right now? Come on, does it ever just seem to you like it's just a little too good to be true? <laughs> and so when they were past the first and the second ward, they came to the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of its own accord, and they went out and passed through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, everybody say, all alone. He said, now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and had delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all of the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, everybody say the thing. He came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, and where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken. Her name was Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate. Watch this now. For gladness. She got so excited. Come on. She got so busy shouting and getting her goosebump on, she forgot her job. Somebody... Open the door, please. Amen. Are y'all with me yet? Yes. And so she runs in, and she's all excited. She's beside herself, and she's telling everybody there, hey, Peter's at the door. And you know what they said? <laughs> You've lost your mind. It's not possible. Oh, it must be his spirit, his angel. See, back during those times, they believed that every person had a spirit or angel being that looked exactly like them, and oftentimes it would appear just after their death with a final goodbye and, you know, a little, are you with me yet? And so at the prayer meeting where they were praying that God would deliver Peter from the hand of Herod and rescue his life, when the miracle finally showed up, their response was, it's not possible. Just can't believe it. And so, I believe today that my goal and my intention is simple. We must open our mind to the miraculous. We build buildings. We send out invitations. We put people at the front door just to shake your hand and tell you how glad we are you came. And then dare to believe that God is actually about to do that which we have set out. Come on. With everything we've done today, every ounce of energy that has been expended from every human being under the sound of my voice today has been all about getting us in this room open to the miraculous. I want to challenge us today. Miracles really do happen. It's not too good to be true. Open your mind to the miraculous. And so there's a story in the Bible in the Old Testament, and I'm not going to take the time to go back and read a bunch of verses of Scripture, but uh, there was an old prophet, and uh, God gave him a word, and so the Bible said that Elijah told the king, okay, boy, it ain't going to rain till I say so. <laughs> can, you, can you imagine how he's standing there with the reigning authority of that day? He looks him in the eye and says, it ain't raining till I say so. Why not? Because I told it don't rain. I turned it off and it ain't coming back on till I say so. Can I tell somebody in this church, you have a voice. You can speak that word of faith. You can start stuff and stop stuff with the voice in your... You just got to be open to the miraculous. I don't have time to dwell on that story, but you all know it if you've been any length in the church or know anything about the Bible, it didn't rain for three years and six months. And at the, Somebody get ready to help me. And at the end of that three years and six months, when it finally did rain, what a storm they did have. 
Acts chapter 12, verse 15 said, Then they said. Everybody said, they said. Come on, Sister Plemons is, she's heard this one so many different times and because she knows it's kind of my thing. But whether you're trying to make your case or convince me of something or maybe win an argument at times, the one thing you don't get to do is tell me they said. <laughs> Unless you can tell me who they are, right. what's their name, when did they say it, what authority did they have to say it? Who were they when they said Are they still around? Can we go back and see if they meant it? They said. So ambiguous. Who were they? Well, I'll tell you who they were. They were the religious elite of the day. They were the Jewish patriarchs of the time. Come on, they were the guys that were supposed to know about this stuff. They were the people that spent their entire lives studying every dot and tittle of the word of God, trying to figure out when this was all going to take place. They said, well, it's his angel. Peter continued knocking. You know what my prayer is today? That God would put a persistent knocking at the door of every heart in this room. Amen. I wish God wouldn't let you sleep. Come on, I wish God would begin to give you day visions and night dreams. Hey, I'm still here. I'm still knocking. It's not over. It's still possible. You can. Peter just kept knocking and kept knocking and kept knocking. Now, the Bible said that this little maiden Rhoda, she said to them, oh, no, oh, no. It was Peter. How do you know? Because I know that voice. Somebody get ready to help me. Did you know that voices are just like fingerprints? They've got technology now that if you say two or three words, they can take it and put it in a computer. They can say, that, no, that's really them. That, only their voice sounds like that. Well, let me tell you something. Peter was outside there knocking, but evidently he wasn't just knocking. Somebody get ready to help me now. He was saying, I know you're in there. Somebody open this door. Hey, I'm out here. I mean, they're in there praying, oh, God, don't let him kill Peter. Oh, God, let Peter come. <laughs> and Peter's out there going, he's already done that. He's already answered that prayer. Your prayers have been answered. Somebody open this door. Watch this. First of all, they gathered together. Then they announced their prayer focus. I love this part of the story. They announced their prayer focus. What are we praying about? Well, we're praying that they don't cut Peter's head off. It'd be so good if they'd just let Peter out of that prison. Are y'all with me yet? And then they actually started praying out loud together. The room was a room filled. Now, you've got to understand something. Mary is the richest lady in the church. She's got the biggest house. She's got the only house big enough for that big a gathering to have that kind of a prayer meeting. And she's so rich that she has a private servant whose name is Rhoda, whose only job is to listen for the door. And so Rhoda, being on point, goes to the door. Who is it? <laughs> it's Peter. Let me in. Peter. Oh, Peter's at the door. And she starts dancing and shouting and having a good time. And the Bible said, for gladness. She opened not the door. And then when she told them what she was all glad about, they said, oh, no, you ain't glad. You're mad. Yeah. <laughs> I wish somebody would get ready to help me now. G-L-A-D-M-A-D. Ain't a big difference in them two words, is there? Come on, are you glad or mad? You know what? We spent our life going through, come on, going through life, and people have said this to you, to your face. What are you mad about? I'm not mad. Now, look, I can tell by the look on your face. You're, what are you mad about? How many times have they ever looked at you and said, what are you grinning about? What are you glad about? Come on. Listen, listen. people want to know what has motivated you. People want to know, hey, hey, what's fixing to happen here? And so when they, when they recognized her gladness, and then decided it was madness. 
she finally got frustrated enough. Somebody get ready to help me now. And she said, well, I'll just show you. And she goes and opens the door. And guess what? It really was Peter. It wasn't his angel. Come on, it wasn't his spirit. It was the man in person, in the flesh, delivered by the angelic. Uh, I'm just trying to help you now. So here's my whole point. The focus of today's lesson is being open to the miraculous, having faith for a miracle. So let's look at the details. First and foremost, the prayer meeting had almost nothing to do with the miracle. They were praying, but they didn't believe it was going to happen. I mean, that, that, I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? Okay. It wasn't predicated on the prophet. Listen to me. Peter had to pinch himself. He thought he was dreaming. He thought it was a vision. So the miracle wasn't predicated on Peter. It wasn't predicated on gladness. You can get glad all you want to. Gladness don't bring the miraculous. You can be glad and shout and go home the way you came. Madness, madness don't affect the miracle. Come on, what affected the miracle? What brought this, I'll tell you what it was. Openness. When they opened the door. I've, I'm just trying to help all of you right now. Listen to me. We get all of these preconceived ideas. Well, you know, those were Bible days. And, well, that only happened in the time of Jesus. Or, well, it was because Peter and James and John were there. Listen to me. None of those things predicated the miraculous. The miraculous happened when people would open their minds, their hearts, and their mouths to the Hey, a miracle can happen. And so when I began to study this, this line of thinking, I thought of all of the excuses and all of the reasons. We pray certain prayers and, you know, we, we, have, we have what I call hope. Come on, y'all, come on, hope and change. Y'all know that, right? We lived through that, didn't we? We got a whole lot of change but very little hope when it was all over and said and done. But hope is an idea. Okay, I'm, 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 see, see, our idea is that it's a dream. It's a, it's a hope. Oh, I hope I win the lottery. Well, you know, somebody asked me one time, Brother Plymouth, you think you'll ever win the lottery? I said, well, I'm almost certain you have to buy a lottery ticket to win the lottery. Oh, yeah. Well, I've never bought a lottery ticket, and I'm not going to buy a lottery ticket. So it's pretty much a given. I'm not. And so this is my premise. But that don't stop God. Somebody, oh, I'm just trying to help you now. Somebody could lose a lottery ticket, and I could find it. And I've had that dream, and you have too. Now, here's the thing. If I found a lottery ticket, or let's just say, let's just say some guy said, hey, I feel like you need to have this, and they handed me a lottery, and it wound up being the winning lottery ticket. Now, here's the problem. It would completely wreck my ministry. I would be finished as a preacher. Why? Because nobody would believe that God gave me that ticket. They'd be looking for video evidence that I stood in line at the 7-Eleven and bought that ticket. Come on, church. Quit being so wistful. You don't need to win the lottery. You won the lottery when you walked in here today. You won the lottery when Jesus called your name. Everybody in this room has the incredible potential of being the glad recipient of the miracle power of salvation through the gift of the Holy Ghost. Right. If you'll just right. open. Yeah. What did Jesus say? Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man will open, 
I will come in. That's the promise of God. I am looking for openness. Would somebody open your faith? Would somebody open your mind? Would somebody open your understanding? Would somebody open your life to the... Somebody open your mouth and speak that word today. Years, years ago, uh, it's been probably 12 years ago now, I was, uh, I was preaching in an old, storied, historied church in uh, way over eastern part of the state, just before you get to Louisiana. And uh, the pastor there, still there now, great guy, Brother, he, Brother Meyer, he awesome man. And uh, he took me in his office one day and he began to tell me about the history of the church. And this particular church had some really notable names in the history ledger that had pastored that church at different various times. I'm talking about like Orlin Ray Foss, C.P. Kilgore. I'm talking about the, the, the greatest pioneering pastors of our faith had passed through that particular pulpit and pastored that church for a period of time. And, and Brother Meyer found out that he won the job with one vote. And he said, the greatest liberating moment of his pastorship came when one of his church board members came in and sat down across the table from him and said, and to think, I'm the one that got you elected. He said, oh, how's that? He said, well, you won by one vote, and I was the deciding vote. He said, really, I did not know that. He said, it's true. He said, but I'm going to tell you right now. He said, better men than you have tried to pass this church and failed. He said, Brother Plemons, I sat there for just a beat, and I started laughing. Then I started pounding on my desk. He said, then I started shouting because that was the day I was liberated. Better men than me have tried and failed. I think I'm going to let God have it from this point forward. He's still there. He's been there almost 40 years. Hey, I got news for you. Better men than you have come and failed. But God saved them anyway. God gave them the miraculous anyway. It was during that revival. Really just an incredible, incredible moment in that revival. I had been preaching every night and just really pushing, trying to get the people's faith high. And, and uh, I had preached and we'd had a big altar call. And people had shouted and danced and had a great time. And, and uh, the service was over. I'd gone over and sat down and turned the service to the pastor. And there was a man there and he came down to the front of the church. He said, Pastor, I hope it's not too late. He said, I should have done this earlier. He said, but my daughter is scheduled for a surgery. And he said, I was wondering if we could pray for this prayer cloth so I could take it to her. Of course, I'm sitting on the front. Of, I'm done. I don't let them do what they're doing. And so several of the men in the church came down and gathered around this brother, and they took this little piece of cloth, and they anointed it with oil, and they began to pray over this cloth for him to deliver to his little daughter. And so in the midst of their praying over this piece of cloth, the Holy Ghost just kind of gave me that little unction, and I got up, and I walked over, and I stood just behind the man in his ear, and I began to speak these words, Father... Don't let him just deliver this prayer cloth, but put a word of faith in his mouth. Yes. Cause him to speak healing into this situation. Let the miraculous be loosed through his words. That man went straight to his daughter's house, knocked on the door. Of course, the husband came to the door, and the daughter was in bed asleep. She had a 6 a.m. surgery coming. And so he went and woke her up, and she came kind of sleepily into the hallway. And this was his testimony the next day. He said, Brother Plemons, he said, something came over me. When I looked up that hallway and I saw my daughter, he said, I couldn't wait for her to come to the door. I broke and I ran to her. And he said, I literally fell on her. And I began to speak the word. God, let the miracle of healing come on her right now. And he said, I could hear you in my ear saying, put a word of faith Amen. in his mouth. The next morning, my phone rang about 6 a.m., and I woke up, and waking up early is not my custom. And uh, the pastor was on the other line, and he said, did you hear about the miracle? I said, Pastor, I, I just woke up. I haven't heard about anything. What are you talking about? He said, you know the man with the prayer call? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, his daughter got up at 2 a.m., told her husband he could turn the alarm off, 
because when she went to the restroom, she washed her face, and when she washed her face, that growth that had literally closed her right eye fell off in the sink and went down the drain. Her eye is completely healed because somebody was open. Somebody get ready. You've got to open your mind, come on, in your hearing and your understanding to receive, but then you've got to let it germinate in your faith, and you've got to speak the word. My goal today is to birth something in every one of us so when we walk out those doors, we walk out saying, I'm looking for a place to plant my miracle faith. I'm looking for a place to plant the seed of miraculous hope. Somebody could be healed. Somebody could be delivered. I was uh, talking to my sister earlier today and she was telling me about where she was going and what she was going to preach in. And I said, you know, I said, I've already taught once today. And I said, in the process of my teaching, the Holy Ghost just anointing me. I said, these are the words that came out of my mouth. God is working overtime behind the scenes to bring about his purpose. Amen. Now, Amen. oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, his purpose. But now here's the key. The focus of his purpose is our deliverance. Come on, our miracle, our salvation. God's purpose is to save us. He don't care about geography. He's not concerned with buildings and lands. And No, 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 no. God is focused on us. I'm so glad to tell you today. I woke up fully cognizant of my realities. Jesus loves me. And Jesus loves you. And he's working overtime to bring about his purpose. And his purpose is your salvation. And then I made this statement to my sister. And it's been, I couldn't wait to get here and tell you. It's been just bubbling in my soul. Listen to me. You really think, come on. I mean, is there any, and is there even just a thread or shred of, of, of a thought in your brain that somehow... God's a failure. God's going to lose. God can't accomplish what he set out to do. Are you kidding me? God can do anything but fail. So if he's working behind the scenes over time to bring about his purpose, which is your deliverance and salvation, and hey, open your mind to the miraculous. It could happen for me. See, Old Sister Freeman's dead and gone now. She was one of the greatest missionaries. She wrote books about it. Thousands upon thousands of people were saved through the Freeman's ministries on the continent of Africa. These were her words. This is what she would say. You got to believe that he will do it and that he will do it for me. Come on, you got to believe that he will do it, and he will do it for you. Somebody understand what I'm preaching to you. God is looking for somebody to work for today. God is looking for somebody to heal, somebody to bless, somebody to deliver. I've said this so many times. I know it's redundant, and I hate redundancy, but the reality is there's no justice in the courthouse. Y'all know that. Y'all know that. It's mortal men with frailties and failures doing the best they can and messing it up, trying to bring about justice into our world. There's no justice at the courthouse. Now, let me tell you where I learned that. I learned that in the courthouse. (laughs) Ever been there? Oh, yeah. I got this little ticket, this little piece of pink paper, and, and it said, on this particular day, at this particular location, This particular police officer was operating this particular machine, and this machine said this man was speeding. Guilty as charged. (laughs) So I went to the courthouse. Now, I thought that, you know, I'm eloquent and I can talk good and I'm going to get in front of that judge. I'm going to tell him my case and I'm going to win him over and he's going to let this go. Well... I got to the courthouse, and it wasn't him at all. It was her, a 50-ish Hispanic lady, cute as a button, sitting up on that 
had that big robe, and she was sitting there with her little gavel, and she was waiting to dispel justice. <laughs> and so I, I took the ticket, handed it to her, and began to explain to her. She said, so, so you're standing here in front of me telling me that you indeed, sir, were speeding. I said, yes, ma'am, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I, I, I was speeding. And she said, and, and what is it that you expect me to do? I said, well, ma'am, I, I came today hoping that you'd be merciful and, and just let this go. She said, sir, you do understand that I have bosses. I have people that I answer to. She said, I have guidelines and regulations that I have to. She said, sir, there's no mercy at the judgment seat. You got to get mercy at the curb. If you can't make your case to the riding police officer, don't expect me to overrule him. She took that little piece of paper and said, you can have this back and pay the clerk on the way out. I'm just saying to you, I'm so glad I'm not going to the great courtroom in the sky. Oh, I'm going to the judgment seat, but I got news for you. The judgment hall is filled with the mercies, uh, come on, of the Lord. His mercies are enduring forever. I don't want justice. I want mercy. And God's divine purpose and his absolute goal is to be merciful to all of us. And when you recognize the merciful hand of God towards all of us, then you can begin to open your mind to the idea, hey, I may not be deserving, but that won't keep God from delivering me. Hey, I may be praying without believing, but it won't keep God from delivering me. Hey, I may not understand exactly what I'm supposed to say or how I should have said it, but it won't keep God from healing me. Hey, I may think I'm dreaming and it sounds too good to be true, but it won't stop God from healing. Hey, open to the mirror. So it wasn't madness, it wasn't gladness, it wasn't the preacher or the prayer meeting. It was the openness that gave us the miracle. And so I've spent the last 20, almost two years now, traveling all over the world. I've I've been crisscrossing the United States, top to bottom and side to side, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of churches. One morning in the state of Oregon, I came to the church house and I had my little phone with me and I was going through the the preliminary part of the service waiting for my turn to get up. And in the process of all that, my phone started giving me information. And the information came in that, hey, hope you don't mind, but you're preaching at my place this morning. And They were using my video because they were quarantined or whatever during the pandemic. And I was preaching in Gresham, Oregon, and I was preaching in Monahans, Texas, and I was and 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 I was I was preaching all over the country. Well then all of a sudden I get this little deal through the messenger and, and, and he said, Sir, I hope you don't mind, but I'm playing your video in our church service here in the Philippines this morning. And then, then I got to the back row of the church, and there's this little fellow there. He's from India. He said, oh, pastor, he said, my family's waiting. They're going to watch you in India this morning. So I'm preaching live in Albany, Oregon, but literally I am preaching in 10 or 12 different places. All of, Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? Open. Because here's the whole point. When I step to the pulpit and I open my Bible, or my iPad as it were, and I began to express the principles and the practicality and the power of God's word to the people. It is an open expression of his love to us. I remember years ago, how long y'all been here, Pastor Wolf, in this building? 10 years. 10 years ago, come on, when we closed the deal, 
See, people don't even realize this. Now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not taking anything away from Pastor and Laura Wolf. They have worked themselves to the bone to make all this happen. But, but they bought a piece of property in a company I work for, came down and built them a building, and then the state of Texas condemned that piece of property and paid him like seven times what we spent building that building. And it just so happened that when they did this, this one was for sale. So they bought this building. And so now, here is an open expression of God's love for the last 10 years right here on Midway Drive. And you, I'm just trying to tell you, God did this. This is a God event. Twenty-one years removed. I'm still going and doing. Listen to me. When I first started doing what I'm doing now, going to churches and preaching meetings, I went to Oklahoma. And it was in Oklahoma that I met what would become one of my most cherished and good friends. And Brother Townsley, after about two weeks of me preaching six, seven times a week and just really pushing and having revival, we were having dinner at his house. And he said to me, so Brother Plemons, you know, you're, you're not really a young man. I wasn't even 40 yet. Oh, the pain. He said, how long do you think you can keep up with this kind of a schedule? And so I dug my head and I thought about it and did some calculation in my brain. And I said, Keith, I think I can do it for about five years. Well, Five became 10, Come on, 10 became 20, and now on my, I'm on my fifth five. <laughs> Three more left and counting. Uh, you know what I decided? I decided I can do this till Jesus comes. I, I decided I can do this. To, somebody said, well, are you going to retire? I said, no, I'm going to die in the pulpit. Amen. I'm just going to be teaching, just fall over and croak right there on the spot. Why? Because it's who I am. It's what I do. Wait, wait, wait. I'm trying to help all of us. I'm open to the miracle. Somebody said, Brother Plymouth, you're a walking miracle. You have no idea. You, I, I can't even tell you how valid that statement is. There's stuff I know about me I'd never tell you. You couldn't drag it out of me with a team of wild horses. I'm going to be transparent, but not that transparent. <laughs> My goal today was to come here and one by one by one. You just keep smiling at me like that. No, we're going to have a Holy Ghost time here in a minute. Amen. She's just been grinning this whole time. I don't know if it's because she's nervous or she likes what I'm saying. Maybe a little bit of both. <laughs> But my goal was that person by person by person, your heart would begin to churn. Come on. And then open it. Come on. When you walked through the door, you weren't really sure what to expect, but you were hopeful. I need to turn your hope into expectation. Amen. See, that, that's the word. Stand with me. I'm going to quit right here. We're going to take an early break and... I'm going to do this again here in about 20 minutes, but listen to me. When hope becomes expectation, literally it said, watch this now, the people were in expectation. One translator says it like this, they were on their tiptoes expecting something. And then when it happened, just can't believe it. <laughs> you know, I, I, th I'm trying so hard to shut this down. Listen, these are the words that I'm praying I can take out of my vocabulary and yours. I just can't believe it. You know what I want to replace that with? Can you believe can you, hey, can, 
Someone once said, and it's become very famous rhetoric, Jesus said it. I believe it. That is it. I got news for you. Whether you believe it or not, if Jesus said it, if Jesus said it, Pastor, come get ready to take this service. Let me just tell you what. This is what Jesus said. Jesus said, I've gone to prepare a place for you. If it were not true, I would have told you. But I've gone that there you may be also. Can you believe it? Jesus has made a place. For you and you and you and you and you. Hey, and he's putting their name on the front door. Plymouth's Manor. Come, I'm just trying to help somebody. Wolf Way. Sharp Palace. Are y'all with me now? Open your mind, open your heart, but don't forget. Open your mouth. Speak the word. Of faith. Let's pray. Father, as I turn this service to our sweet pastor, I want you to bless your people today. God, I want you to prepare their hearts and their minds to receive the message of hope that's coming in this second service. God, as people began to gather in, Lord, and those that are coming to the second service, God, let this same expectation of faith begin to lift into their souls. As they come and sit upon these chairs, let the weariness of this life, the tiredness of their minds, the doubt of their faith, let it be absolved of them and let faith and joy and expectation come into their lives. In Jesus. Clap your hands, Pastor. We love you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to invite everybody next door. We have some coffee, water, some pastries. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time of fellowship. We'll come back over here at 11 and just keep right on going. Thank you, Lord, for this time we've had together. Thank you for this wonderful word. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll bless our time of fellowship. Bring us back together again. We lift you up. We praise the name of Jesus. Man, Lord bless you.